Late night taco delivery. Late night taco delivery. Late night taco delivery. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Late Night Taco Delivery. This is Daniel Gill. And I'm Jonathan Knoll. And for the next hour or so, we'll be talking about nerd stuff. Yep. Well, uh, tonight I was on my way home and I uh, had a rather nasty fall. It's been really icy out. Oh, no. Yeah, I. Nothing too bad. I last year I broke my knee, so I was really afraid that I had rebroken it. Turns out I'm fine. Okay. If I had if I had broken it though, I would have totally canceled tonight. Yeah, you would definitely have reason to. Yeah. Uh, so what are you geeking out about this week? Um. Well, I actually watched a bit of the uh, Super Bowl last night. Oh yeah. Um. Well, I actually watched uh, the commercials on YouTube because uh, we've got a rather nasty. Uh, snowstorm yesterday. Right. Yeah. I was supposed to go to my parents' place and watch the Super Bowl with my dad, because it was kind of a tradition. So I drove all the way out there in the really bad conditions, and while I was there, I shoveled off their walk and I shoveled off their porch. And literally half an hour later, I went outside to have a cigarette with my father, and everything was covered again. Gross. And I'm like, you know what? If it's going to keep doing this, I don't want to drive home when the game's over. And my dad's like, I, my dad's like, I agree with you. So I drove home and I basically just spent the evening watching the snow and and playing on the, on the internet. Some rather amusing commercials that came out yesterday on the uh, Easter on uh, Super Bowl. That's what I heard. I was uh, working that night, so. Yeah, Brian Cranston reprised his role as uh, <coughs> Walter White from Breaking Bad mm -hmm. for Esurance, so which he plays a sort of Greg, not your usual pharmacist Greg, but he's a man, a man in his 50s who drives a Pontiac gas tech and also deals in pharmaceuticals. Right. And was demanding that the customer call him by his name, which was sort of Greg. Mm -hmm. And then she gave her her sort of prescription. Huh. Um, then there was the uh, Clash of Clans uh, with, <laughs> with Liam Neeson repricing I yeah, his I saw role something about Taken. That. It was funny. You love, I will, of course, I will get revenge. Oh. So says Angry Neeson 52. <laughs> uh, let's see. Last night was also really big for a lot of new trailers. Yes. I, of which I saw two. Okay, which one did you watch? Uh, I saw the one for Tomorrowland. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I feel about it. I, I feel like we're going to have another Jupiter Ascending situation here. Mm-hmm. I'm very excited. I love Brad Bird's work. It looks very, very visual. Yeah. Very exciting. And the Disney has been really working hard on this one. Yeah, that's what I've heard. And they've been pulling all sorts of stuff out of the archives, and it it, it looks to be something that a lot of love went into. But again, I'm wary because it just has that look about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other trailer that I saw, regretfully, was Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, yes, Fifty Shades of Grey. <sighs> or as I describe it, if you're going to be in a sexually abusive relationship, make sure it's with a multimillionaire with fantastic hair. <laughs> uh, that thing started out as Twilight fanfiction. I mean, really. Yes, fanfiction of Twilight between Bella and Edward, and I'm sad that I know this. This information could be used for some, something much better in my brain, like a chili recipe, or a proper way to flush a toilet. You know, something useful. How to change out the rolls of toilet paper. Apparently, the, they say it's going to be the most pornographic mainstream movie in 20 years. At least they have goals? Yeah, they said like 20 minutes of the film out of 100 minute film is sex scenes. And I'm like, really? <sighs> I'm, you know, I have the internet. Yeah. Uh, I can find this stuff for free. Hell, I could find a man fucking a horse if I wanted. Yes. Oh, um, though I have to admit, one of the funniest things that's ever happened to me at Walmart was, um, I was standing there, you know, doing my shtick as a cashier, and this woman stormed up and started yelling at me about the fact we were carrying Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> She's like, this is smut. Why is Walmart carrying smut? And I looked her in the eye. And I didn't say it, but in the back of my brain, I'm like, yes, ma'am, you're right. It's smut. But worse than that, it's poorly written smut. There is, <laughs> there is so much better written smut in the, in the, on the Internet, and it's for free. Go forth, ma'am, and look for better smut. Ah, oh, Christ. Seriously, 
every time the word smut is bandied about, automatically my mind goes to the song by Tom Lehrer called Smut. It's very funny. Mm-hmm. Tom Lehrer was a funny guy. Oh, yeah. Uh, this week I am geeking out about, well, last Thursday I bought the movie Tusk. Yes. Kevin and, Smith. And I watched it and I loved it. Mm. So fucked up. Mm. He has definitely changed from his uh, clerk's days, hasn't he? Oh, yeah. Definitely progress has been made since. <laughs> it was just thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, remind me never to go to Manitoba anytime soon. <laughs> but the Yeah, clerk... sure, you betcha. <laughs> Thanks. But uh, the characters were really well... Yeah. The characters were really well-rounded. The story was well-crafted. I mean, I... Having listened to some of the episodes that it's based on, mm -hmm. of Smodcast, it, it was very well done. So, more power to him. Can't wait for Yoga Hosers. Yes, yes. I'm actually kind of hoping, but I'm not, but unfortunately watching Johnny Depp's uh, star power be dis disintegrating, I'm kind of hoping that Yoga Hosers become a bigger success than a lot of other uh, John, um, Kevin Smith movies, but I just don't see it happening. Yeah, I mean... I think, thankfully, in this case, Johnny Depp's performance was diminished. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, the best actor in that movie, I mean, this guy deserves an Academy Award because he, you listen to his voice and you're just like, and then what happened? <laughs> just looking, at him, looking up at him with big old eyes and your hands underneath your chin. Are you talking about Johnny Depp or the uh, Michael Parks character? Michael Parks character. Holy oh, Michael Parks God. is an amazing character. Oh, dude, that his performance though. Oh. Oh yeah, well he is Michael Parks is he's a known quantity. That's why Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez, and Kevin Smith just absolutely adore him. Well, yeah, with good reason. <laughs> mm-hmm. He actually, it actually seems like he gives a shit, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, this is man's craft. He's been doing it for 50 years, and he wants to make sure he does a good job. He doesn't want to phone it in like so many other actors do these days. <coughs> yeah. So, all right. So, shall we get on to the geek news? Oh, okay, go ahead, and just uh, you throw up some, go some ge good geek news. All right. Well, this week we begin with a Texas boy suspended after bringing the Ring of Power to school. What? Yeah! <laughs> Uh, he, he Did he brought... just get up and start chanting, One ring to rule them all! One ring to find them! Now give me my juke po juice box! <laughs> no, he was he was suspended for it, though. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh... I... Uh, could you please explain why he was... What, what, was... Did he bring a sword with him? No, it was just the ring, and he told, I. Uh... See, nine-year-old boy, Aiden Stewart. So... Uh, apparently they got permission to use his name. Uh-huh. I uh, told a classmate he could make him disappear with the ring. And, uh, he was suspended for it. Did the principal think, and by ring, I mean meth? <laughs> I don't know. It, it's just too ridiculous to... This this belongs on what, uh... On what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah, this is a Fark.com article. Yeah. Oh my lord! Really? No, wow. it's uh, Daily News from hmm. yeah. Oh, New York Daily News. Jeez. Yeah. So that's fun. Mhm. Mm uh. Are they just uh, outlawing imagination now or something? It's Texas. Uh. No, I don't think Texas and steers are queers, boy. And I don't see no horns on you. <laughs> Uh, uh, next we have a new uh, Teen Titans series. Yes, it's going to be a live-action one. Yes. Um, on what I'm actually most excited about with this is they're talking about uh, having uh, Oracle, Barbara Gordon. Really? Yes. The uh, Barbara Gordon, this will be the Oracle version of the character, although she's not referred to as Oracle in the pilot. She used to be Batgirl, but is now in a wheelchair. It says she helps the team with her hacking computer skills which is the part that Dinah Meyer played in uh, the very short-lived Birds of Prey TV series. I loved that series. I never watched it. Never had a chance. I own it on DVD. Uh-huh. Uh, yes. Robin is in there. 
Uh, actually, course. I'm sorry, Nightwing. Uh, excuse me, Nightwing. I I know, I know. It's just one of those meh. Now the two that are kind of they're going to have Barbara Gordon, Hawk and Dove, uh, Raven and Starfire. Hmm. Uh, the two that are the three that are miss. I'm sorry, the two that are missing kind of conspicuously are Beast Boy, and aka a, yeah, a Beast Boy and aka Changeling, and Cyborg. Thing is, is that he's always been called he's been called Beast Boy for a number of years. But the first time I ever ran into the character was back in a 1982 George Perez uh, Teen Titans comic, where he was named Changeling, and it's just he's never been Beast Boy to me because of that. Huh. Like it's Changeling. That's his name is Changeling. Stop it. Stop changing his name. <sighs> I. Apparently, the reason why Cyborg won't be in there is because of the Zack Snyder Justice League movie. Hmm. <sighs> I guess they're going to have to find someone else to fill their affirmative action points now, aren't they? I guess so. I just... When it comes to the Justice League film, the fact that they're not using any of their other uh, actors from their TV series for the movie mm -hmm. is kind of pissing me off. Hmm. Because... That's the kind of universe where you want a cinematic universe. Exactly. That's why Arrow and Flash work so well together. They're two great tastes that just taste great together. Yeah, it'd be awesome to have them, you know, team up against, team up with Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. Yeah. You know, have some. Uh, we are reaching a point in media where they where they can have these crossovers. Mm-hmm. Beast Boy, eh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I like Beast Boy and all, but... Eh. So he's in, so he's out, whatever. Okay, fair enough. Somebody's gonna kill me on on the internet, I know. Oh no, the internet. Eh. Someone insulted me on the internet. I saw I saw a picture of it, it looked like a Viking, and it's, it, the, the tagline was, How sad, how weak you must be to be hurt by my mere words. <laughs> Uh, apparently they're making a new Frozen short. Y yay? Uh, honestly, I was over Frozen back when it was two months old. I saw it in the theaters back in January two, four, 2014 when I was able to actually get out of the house, because that was during a major freaking storm. Yeah. And I watched it, and I was like, oh, okay, it's not too bad. I mean, I, I, I enjoyed it. I didn't feel like I wasted my, my two hours and my... Uh, Oh no! Like five bucks. It's well. It's a well done movie. It's just, it's become so saturated. It, it's the same reason I don't like The Lion King. It's become so saturated in the popular zeitgeist that it's just no longer enjoyable. Well, basically, from what I, what I saw happen is that Disney has not had a an animated hit in a long time. I mean, a real big animated hit. Mm -hmm. um, and the last time I saw this happen was Lilo and Stitch back in two thousand two. Right. Where they suddenly had a popular character and some popular music, and they're like, "Oh my god!" And they've absolutely just glutted the market with everything Stitch and Lilo you can possibly imagine. And it backfired on them. They had all this unsold Lilo and Stitch stuff, especially when I, when I was working at Disney at the time. Mm -hmm. um, well, with Frozen, they're doing exactly the same thing, because apparently they had, did not have a lot of merchandising in place when it first came out. They had <sighs> some small things, but the movie was a, was, a, was a considered surprise hit for Disney, so they've been pumping it out ever since. And apparently there seems to be an un ending demand from preteen girls for this crap. Eh, let and them have some, it. And some interesting old men. Yeah. Oh, God. You had to I'm say sorry, that, man. I, oh, yeah. Hey, man, I wouldn't get my, get my tongue stung on Elsa, stuck, stuck on Elsa in certain places. Yes. <coughs> Quite. Things you do not need to know about your co-host. <laughs> oh, it's a podcast. We can say whatever we want, man. Anyway. Yes. Uh... Simpsons. Simpsons? Yeah, the Simpsons are back in the news. They did a pixel uh, pixel art opening. Oh, okay. So it looks neat. Okay. Um, sorry for all the children of the 90s. Former Power Rangers sa Samurai cast member arrested for murder. Yes, I heard about this this morning. Ricardo Mandina Jr., who played the Red Ranger on Power Rangers Wild Force, and Decker on Power Rangers Samurai, has been arrested on charges of murder. TMZ reports that Mandina was arrested in Palmdale, California, after a fight went down between him and his roommate Joshua Sutter. Law enforcement, info Law enforcement sources says that Medina went to his bedroom with his girlfriend, but that Sutter forced his way in, and Medina stabbed him in the abdomen with a sword. Oh, God. Now, if 
question of course has become is if he was attacked and he's defended himself whether he will uh, be able to get off or not but still the fact that he killed a dude with a sword <laughs> they uh... need more of that in this one in this world right now is people attacking people with medieval weaponry right what so, a time I, 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 to I, I gotta wonder if it was if it was like you know his dra- his dragon sword sword or something no oh. Oh, that'd be sad. Did he have it like he'd up on a display and he's just like every once in a while he's like, "Oh, I was a great act. I, I, I had made a lot of money back then." And then his <laughs> roommate fraction is like, "Oh no, sword on!" <laughs> just like gutted oh, him. Oh, oh god. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the series Gotham is uh being interesting again. Okay, I heard something about that they're going to be uh, finally introducing uh, more of the Joker. Which is, the... which just is awesome in general. Yeah, you were talking last week about them putting the Red Hood story in there, so I guess this is just a continuation of that. Yep. So, that that's exciting. Also to be exci- also exciting is Brian Cranston, rumored to be up for Star Trek III villain. villain. Mm-hmm. I... <laughs> I like the way that the uh, these new mo- Star Trek movies have been going on. Mm-hmm. It's a new look, and it's a different way of looking at the same stories. So, I'm all for it. Okay. Well, you know, I'm willing to give it a shot. Mm-hmm. Now, you were talking about uh, Star Trek reboots earlier on, and I'm like, you know, the problem with the new Star Trek TV series you know, movies is they've basically taken... You know the a lot of the heart and the science and exploration and just you know inserted explosion and lens flare here. Yeah, and I'll agree with you to a certain extent, but at the same time, as any great adaptation works, if it gets the viewer interested in what came before it, oh yeah, oh then yeah, then there's there's already been a win. Mm-hmm. I will agree with you there. I will not be the I will not be the old grumpy guy that way though. All right. Speaking of old and grumpy versus young and busted, uh huh. Why don't you tell us what the, this week's subject is? Actually, I've got a couple more stories first. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Sorry about that. No, it's no problem. Uh, last week we had the Fantastic Four trailer. Okay. N- zero interest here. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it. I have zero interest too. Actually, it's not looking interesting, at all. No, no, it's not. I mean. Last time, the movies were okay. They weren't great, but they were okay. Mm Mm-hmm. This just looks like it's going to be, like, gravity mixed with interstellar, mixed with some kind of ghost of the Fantastic Four. Mm. Which, I'm kind of tired of Hollywood making movies that look pretty or movies that tell a story. What movies were supposed to do at the beginning was do both. Mm-hmm. So, there we go. It went away. Yeah. Finally, uh, big dumb story. Okay. Superman is getting a new power. What is he getting? The power to choose the best Italian restaurant? I don't know. Maybe he's getting back super weaving. Ooh, super weaving. Oh, uh, that was fun. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, so, so have they announced what this power is going to be, or they're see. just letting you, giving it out to say, "Be warned, Superman's getting this new power." Uh, let's see, according to the uh, according to the article, it looks like it's going to be a uh, there's going to be a big thing that happens, so he's going to develop this in response. Doesn't hmm. say anything particular about it. Jeez, what an amazing concept that is! <sighs> you know, I, I, it's one problem I've always had with Superman is he's he's a duas machina character. Oh yeah, totally I love him as a character. I love that you know he tries so hard, but I never get a feeling he's actually in danger. Yeah. Uh, finally, we have a Star Wars costume exhibit. Oh. Yes, it's a new Star Wars costume exhibit. It's debuting in Seattle. Okay. Uh, notable uh, exhibits include a uh, an evolution of Palpatine's costumes. So as he becomes goes from being a senator to the emperor, 
mm-hmm. which looks interesting. They also have one of the original Stormtrooper armors, mm. which is uh, really awesome because the original Stormtrooper armor is really brittle. Mm. I mean, really, it was meant to just last a few months. Right, so right. It was basically that... just vacuum formed and yeah. tossed together. So the fact that it's uh, stuck around as this long is really impressive. Nice. So let's hope it comes uh, comes here locally. Well, um, one of the things I was going to talk about later on the night is um, back in the early 2000s, the Star Wars The Magic of Myth came through to, uh, Toledo. It was one of the place, a few places in the United States that it was showing at a museum. And it was nothing but artwork and information about Star Wars. The inspirations, uh, original mo- uh, models, uh, makeup, uh, uh, lots of cool stuff. Yeah. So that's the geek news, and that makes a perfect segue for this week's episode. What we, ha- what we have this week is basically George... L- just a couple weeks ago, George Lucas threw a big hissy fit about not having his ideas for the new Star Wars movies used for uh, these new Star Wars movies. <coughs> to which the in- internet automatically said, an uproar is good! Yeah. Because when the first few movies came out, it was they were being made by a young George Lucas who was not entirely sure of whether or not this would even work. Mm-hmm. So he had a lot to lose, and therefore made a, took a lot of risks. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he basically, up until um, Star Wars, he only directed uh, three movies. Yeah. Uh, THX 11138, uh, American Graffiti, and then he did Star Wars. Yep. Which was not his first choice. Yeah. He originally wanted to do Flash Gordon. Mm-hmm. And I, I honestly, I'd kind of like to go to the, that alternate universe where he did get the rights to Flash Gordon, because <laughs> S- King Syndicate said no. Anyway, I'd like to go and see what a Flash Gordon by George Lucas would look like. A young mm. George Lucas. Yes, yes, a one who's it's like, I have no fucks to give, I am going to do this. Yeah. Uh, so, every, every year, twice a year, I personally go through what I call my Star Wars cycle, which is I have to watch all the movies, all the documentaries, uh, all the different versions of the movies, so I end up watching both the originals, the special editions, everything I can get my hands on. Mm -hmm. And so, if I seem a bit obsessed, that's why. (laughs) Uh, So, I think it's time that We, as a podcast, went to where we thought we would originally go, which is a good old-fashioned old versus new. Yes, yes. Because basically both these movies hit us at certain times in our lives that helped shape our formative years. Mm -hmm. For me, it was A New Hope. For you, it was A Phantom Menace. Well, actually, not strictly true. I experienced A New Hope, but I experienced it through the special edition. Mmm, okay, okay. I experienced it when the ads were going, Star Wars, if you've only experienced it on the TV screen, you haven't seen it at all. (laughs) And then you'd have the X-Wing come out of the TV, and it was really, really cool. Yeah. But yeah, I lived through the special editions. And there are certain things that I totally agree with hardcore fans about. Mm Mm-hmm. Han shot... First, yes. Um, Jabba the Hutt probably shouldn't be in the movie. No, no, he should not. He should not have been cut back in. The um, special effects were not that good. But let me let me tell you a little bit. Uh, first off, let's discuss a little bit about, about my first reactions to Star Wars. Go for it. Okay. Set the Wayback Machine for 1977. 1977. 1977. I was four years old. Yes, I'm an old guy. And my parents had taken my sister and I down to Florida to go visit grandparents mm-hmm. and uh, aunts and uncles and various other people because apparently my, fam- my most of my family loves Florida except for my particular family. Uh, both my dad and I agree that uh, we hate Florida. It's full of alligators and other things that are going to try to eat you. And idiots. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, Basically, it's like living in Orlando. Um, All the drivers are either tourists or old people. (laughs) And they can't drive. Yes. And you have interesting people who try to eat faces. Yes, yes they are. Uh, The zombie apocalypse will start in Florida. Um, and, and frankly, uh, FARC, it's the only state by itself that has a tag on FARC. So, <laughs> anyway. Anyway. No, um, so we went down there, um, and my parents would love to, one of the things they would love to do is to uh, take it, go on a, a date night. Mm-hmm. They would foist my sister and myself off of my grandparents, and then they would go eat, re- eat at a fancy restaurant and then go see a movie. Right. And so they went and to the local theater and watched, you know, were looking for this movie that, you know, no one really ever heard of called Star Wars. And so they went and saw it in a nearly empty theater. Right. Opening night. And immediately after the movie was over, I drove back to my grandparents' place, grabbed me and my sister, and went and watched it again. <laughs> because it was just, oh my god, amazing. And my sister was much more inspired by Star Wars than I ever was. But she, you know, has the has an entire box of Star Wars stuff. She's got still got her, all of her original toys. Mm. Uh, you know, she's got the Pepperidge Farms C-3PO cookies. You know. Wow. Yeah, That's well, not some... the originals, but they have the boxes. Wow. Yeah, I want to want to face down 35-year-old cookies. <laughs> <laughs> no. But no, I, I I was inspired by Star Wars my entire life. I went and saw all three of the movies in the theaters. Um, in 97, I was uh, down at Disney for my college internship, and I saw A New Hope as it was re-released. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember that the fi- the film broke. <laughs> so I didn't actually see the destruction of Alderaan. Oh. And talking about how amazing it was. Like, oh, my God. I'm like, okay, I, I didn't see it. And apparently they changed it again when they did the expanded editions on, on DVD, so I never actually saw the original explosion that they had done for the uh, the updated version. At some point, I'll uh, send your way a copy. Okay, but no, it was a, you know it was a great movie, great series, uh, and then we get into unfortunately um, uh, Phantom Menace. Yes. Now, for me, when in 1988 when they when they announced that they were going to do Phantom Menace, uh, I went into total media lockdown. Yes. I did not watch any trailers. I did not watch commercials. If they were ta- having a making of or something on Entertainment Tonight, I would leave the room. I'd leave movie theaters if they were showing the trailer. <laughs> I would walk out, get a drink, use the John, come back in. And so I wanted to go in completely fresh. There was n- literally, I knew nothing about these movies except for like whatever Darth Maul looked like because you couldn't escape him. Right. And he looks <laughs> awesome. He looks still awesome. does. Though I still remember thinking it was hilarious that. Uh, during that same time period, Godzilla was being made. The, uh, oh, the Matthew Roland Broderick version, and Roland, Roland Emmerich. Emmerich version. Oh, and there was a, a friendly rivalry between the two where it says, you know, Godzilla said size does matter, and Phantom Menace says plot does matter. Story <laughs> does matter. And I'm like, you know, in hindsight, I'm like, oh, George, oh, George, you're adorable. Anyway. Yeah. So, went into the theater, opening night, had bought our tickets early, you know. This was at the same time as Ma- Matrix had just come out mm. and The Mummy with uh, Brendan Fraser. Which is still so, a funny movie. If you haven't seen it, stop this podcast and watch it because it's funny. And oh, so really, it's really well done. Thing. Yeah. And 99 was a great movie, for, a great year for movies. Mm-hmm. So going to theater at our local, what I, I refer to as our Googleplex because we're like 20, 20 uh, screens. Um. People were in costume. They had radio stations doing uh, on the on the spots, the broadcasting. They had contests. Places just packed to the gills. Lights go down. Star Wars appears on the screen. Place just freaking erupts. Mm-hmm. And we're like, yeah, woo! And then we sat there and watched the movie. And at the end, we're just like, clap, clap. Clap. What 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 did we just watch? What no, it couldn't be that bad. I honestly thought it was my fault. I thought I was in the bad, wrong memory. I, I thought I was in the wrong uh mindset. So I went and saw it again. And, and 
couldn't imagine that this movie was as bad as I thought it was. I actually saw the movie three times in the theater before I could let myself understand that George Lucas had assaulted my childhood. Uh, and that has been the cry of the angry nerd ever since. Yes. And now you, my friend, you have said that you would like to get try to defend that. You would like to stand up. Hi. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you. Okay. No, it is now your job to stand up and say, no, 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 he wasn't that bad. I mean, he was, he's just, he's okay. He, he did, he... Well, I'm not going to say that it's necessarily okay. It's not mm-hmm. as bad as everybody thinks it is. It's still mm-hmm. bad. Oh, yeah. There, there are still, there is still bad here, but it's not as bad as all that. Hmm. My first experiences with Star Wars came when I was just an infant. I was, you know, I was, I was present for when the special editions came out. Mm. I would have been two, technically speaking, but I do remember one of my earliest memories is sitting in the car, waiting for my mom to come back in from the store, where she was picking up the collector's edition of the special editions on VHS Mm. from back in 1997. And I... I love the uh, the Return of the Jedi special edition. It mm. is on my top fifty list of movies. Mm. I think it is a superior being to the original. I know the internet called "I'm about to die." Bla- or, or as as, as uh, Randall said, blasphemy. Hear me out. Okay, I'm listening. <sighs> but I, I guess my true experience really comes in in 1999 where i went to the very first star wars celebration convention star wars celebration one i still have my tag for it Mm -hmm. and that is where i saw star wars the phantom menace and for me as a kid of maybe four years old Mm -hmm. it was the coolest shit ever (laughs) oh yeah oh yeah you had you had fast-moving things. You, you had fast-moving pod races. You had awesome sword fights. It was, it was take all of the uh, awesome bits of Star Wars that I was just barely understanding, and put it on steroids. I was still also four years old. Right. I had a good time at the convention and. Uh, Saw all sorts of things. Got to sit in the cockpit of one of the original X-Wing props. Really Fun. cool, by the way. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, just... It, I... I've always been very tied close to these movies. Mm-hmm. But, again... As have I. Yeah. It, the it's problem not... is, is that when it went back and changed so much of what I remembered, and did not always do it for the better. Right. Now, episode two came out, we camped out for it. Episode three, I actually wasn't allowed to see episode three until it came out on DVD. Really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's it's really the most intense of the, of the prequel trilogy. Mm-hmm. It really, it brings everything to a crescendo, which is just where it needed to be to make it the best of the, of the trilogy. I know, I've said it in the past... To you, that means it's the best version of herpes. Yeah, the best Mexican wine. No. <laughs> I, I've i never actually seen the third one. I can't bring myself to do it. And whenever it's, there's a chance, I'm like, I, I, there are better things I can do with my life. Like, I don't know, clean the grout in my bathtub. At <laughs> some point, I highly <laughs> recommend you do it. I know. I'm going to do it. I have to do it. I'll probably do it before uh, uh, the new Star Wars comes out in 2015. Good. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> okay. I'll hold you to watching Akira. Done. Fair enough. All right. Uh, from there, I also was a heavy watcher of the Jenny Tartakovsky version of the Clone Wars series. Mm-hmm. Didn't watch the three, uh, the CGI version. No, no. Just saw no point. I was there at Star Wars Celebration 4 during the 30th anniversary celebration, and... Uh, if George Lucas wasn't out 
uh, filming Indiana Jones, I would have been in the same room with him. Ah. Uh, I know, right? And then he went and did uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Yep. <sighs> I think that's what happened. Is a lot of ge- geeks just got very, very saddened by George Lucas. They, 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 he was trying to make his own stuff. He was taking a character, he, he characters he helped create and helped he develop, mm-hmm. and he was doing his own shtick. And unfortunately, it it became a, 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 a the clarion call of no, no, you're not doing it right. How am I not doing it right? It's my characters. No, no, we're the fans. We demand you do these things. But why should I do these things? You're not in charge of this. <laughs> Exactly, and that's part of why I respect George Lucas for going back and doing the special editions, because it, it as as artists, it's an it's an oft put point that a work of art is never finished; it's just abandoned. Yeah, a, a work of I think it was on one of the I think it was on the Clone Wars DVD was the line of uh, this movie wasn't finished; it escaped. Yeah, so. He got a second bite at the apple, and he took it. Mm-hmm. And I can respect that. At the same time... I... At the ahead, same time, ahead. though, there are certain things that, if you do that, become ana- anachronistic. Mm-hmm. Like Greedo shooting first. Right. And... In my, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's been brought up numerous times before that... The whole thing about Han Solo shooting first, that was the point of the character. He was a devil-may-care, didn't give a shit... Exactly. Um, to look out for number one kind of guy. Yeah. And he changes over the course of the three movies. Yeah. What George Lucas was trying to do was to make the character look like a hero. But the thing is, wasn't he wasn't a hero yet. Yeah. He was going through his own hero's journey just like... Uh, like Luke. Like Luke. Yeah. So, I can understand why people get all up in arms about that. I do, too. Be right back. Of, co- of course. Um... Yeah, no problem. Well, okay, I'm back. I'm oh, back. oh, sorry, I was, I was tell a story. And my, unfortunately, my headset did not switch, uh, go far enough to get to the window. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, uh, this is gonna be bad. So, unlike yeah. you, who hey. runs off the toilet every, you know, Halfway twenty minutes through every so. episode. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. But I am but in I, a, I am in a long line of toilet users. Understand? Me and Ringo Starr. Anyway. Um, I should use toilets as opposed to the outside trees. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, uh, so what other things about the special edition do you get all up in arms about? Let the Wookiees, let the Ewoks sing, damn it. I disagree. Yup, nub. Eat up, yup, nub. That song is obnoxious. And that doesn't matter. It still was the original, and that was the way that they did it. And now they went to this other strange version. It's not and also, um, and also the unfortunate Jedi rocks. Okay, that can be explained though. Yes, go ahead. Uh, in the original version of Return of the Jedi, we had a song called um, "Let Me Look It Up." Okay. Return of the Jedi. Uh... Max Rebo Band and the. Uh, here's what. Let's see. Uh, Songs. Uh, lappy, ne- uh, lappy neck. Work it out. The lyrics were about dancing. Yes. And I have yet to meet. So- I have yet to meet somebody who is uh, sad about losing us. But there is a reason, and it is because what happened was back in 1983, they had an outsider. Pl- an outside performer come in and perform the song and it was written by John Williams and George Lucas had some kind of hand in it much like Gene Roddenberry had a hand in the opening to Star Trek Mm -hmm. and what happened was after the after the movies ended with Return of the Jedi they let the copyright lapse Mm. So a bunch of different artists came in and took the took the song and performed it, and they had the copyright for it. The other thing is that when the special editions came about, 
They actually went to uh, a <laughs> real performer. I, her name escapes me. But uh, she basically said, no, I don't want you using this. It's mm-hmm. really early in my career, and I don't want it seen. Yeah. So, in order to still have the scene where you get Ula the, Dan- Ula the Dancer into mm-hmm. the Rancor pit to set up the horror that is the Rancor. Right, and also this is a place where we, we said that there was a boob. Yes. You can't forget the boob, which was left <laughs> in the special edition. Yay, DVD. Yes, it is still in the special edition. Thank God. Anyway, uh, in order to keep that scene, they put in Jedi Rock, and they put in a new sequence with uh, Yuzum and... Uh, Jao Wa- Jao Weyaza was his name. He was the Yuzum. And I'm sorry, it was a useless character. It was just, it was ugly. It was very bad CGI. Well, the whole point of the, uh, the whole point of that scene is basically, well, why don't we, ha- what, are, what is our audience going to expect the very least? A musical number! Yeah! So, in general, the scene is kind of, why is that there to begin with? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, a lot of people get up in arms about it. Well, there's a reason to. Yes, but Lucas's hands were tied. There wasn't any way he could get around that. Mm. So, yes, be angry, but understand why. Now, about the victory song at the end of Return of the Jedi. Yup, no. Yup, no. Okay, the Ewoks are kind of the least useful characters of the spe- of the uh, originals. I don't know, man. They, they kicked some serious ass against the Empire. Yes, which means that the Emperor's top, uh, top brass and top guns mm-hmm. were no match for, uh, for little people... Throwing, for little, for, for little, for, te- little vicious teddy bears. For little vicious teddy bears throwing rocks. You know where else that happens? Star Trek V. You know what else that happens? Vietnam. Yes. Yes, Return of the Jedi is an analogy for Vietnam. Oh, Christ. Okay, so first we have Walrus Cast, where the Empire is a... is a... is a metaphor for communism, because it's still the Cold War, believe it or not. Mm. And now we have... The Ewoks are a metaphor for Vietnam. Yes, they are. They are a metaphor for Viet Cong. <sighs> Boy, is my are my horizons expanded? Aren't they though? Oh, Christ! But the Ewok victory song is definitely a product of its time, and mm-hmm. it just plays too kid friendly for me. It always did. Mm, I don't know. I always liked it. It always seemed like a, a happy thing. It was like they've gone through this really traumatic experience, this really vicious battle. Let the Ewoks sing, man. Let the Ewoks sing. Well, and then of course, this is one of my big arguments with start with uh, with uh, uh, George Lucas going back and reshooting things mm-hmm. is when he put Hayden Christensen at the end instead of of uh, Sebastian Shaw. We do not speak of that. Hey, hey, man! You wanted to bring this up. You wanted to defend the uh, the the, the, re- the prequels and the remake and the uh, the special editions. You got to take everything with it. You got to take the bad with the good. Okay, that I will get up in arms about because I hate that just as much as everybody else does. Mm-hmm. The reason why I say that the 1997 version of Return of the Jedi is far superior is because it still has Sebastian Shaw, Anakin Skywalker at the end. Mm, good point. Okay, see, that's the other problem I have with the the the, the, uh, the re- revised editions, the special editions. Uh huh. Is because Lucas couldn't leave well enough alone. And he re- kept going back and changing things and tweaking them and adding stuff and taking things out and it's just like, no, no, George, stop, stop. You, I, I understand you have the power to do this, but stop. You realize he was doing that from the very beginning too, you know. Mm. There is a scene in the very first one where they're in the Death Star control room with the lock the doors and hope they don't have blasters scene. Mm. And C-3PO has, in the original version, has a line that was added just a couple months later in its run, 
in its release. Hmm. So, George Lucas was changing his vision from the beginning. Um, my opinion, it sounds more along as not just changing your vision, but in being indecisive. Exactly. It's like he can He's just like running up to the. It's like running up to the Mona Lisa and and Leonardo da Vinci going, "Nope, I don't like this brush stroke. I'm gonna change this real quick. Nope, nope, I don't like this. I'm gonna change this real quick." Well, like, no, no, leave it alone. Stop. Well, you remember my quote from the very beginning here, where I, art is never finished; it's just abandoned. Mm -hmm. That quote for, was, ironically enough, from Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah. Anyway, well, just, Lucas can't abandon it. <laughs> Now I do, I do want to bring a couple of things that George Lucas not he's not a he's not a dumb man don't get me wrong he's no. not a stupid man at all um, he took a what was basically a small film and made it into a merchandising empire like no other absolutely it's why we uh, have so much merchandise right basically uh, for those uh, those not in the know originally the uh, Star, Star, New Hope was way over budget mm -hmm. and so he forgo his directing salary in exchange for merchandising rights to the film. Um, at the time, there really wasn't a lot of merchandising for movies, or especially uh, sci-fi films. I mean, Mego had done a couple of the uh, Planet of the Apes toys, but that was really about it. And those look and, awesome, too. Yeah, and George Lucas took the merchandising rights to Star Wars and you know, contacted this little tiny co company named Kenner about making action figures, and then T-shirts, and... Uh, oh, yeah, it was... Uh, cer breakfast cereal tie-ins, and what do you get a Wookiee for Christmas when he already has a comb... And just built a multi-billion dollar empire on top of it. Exactly. And it's very prosperous, still is. Mm -hmm. I, we have a, a family catchphrase about whenever Lucas does a new thing with Star Wars, or did anything with Star Wars, because now it's owned by Disney. Oh, uh, uh, George Lucas needs a new pool. Uh, no, actually it was, well, time to milk the cash cow. Yeah. <laughs> Yup no. Eat up. Yup no. <laughs> let the Ewok. You're not gonna win this conversation with me, man. Let the let the Ewoks dance. Yes, let but I think sing. that the I think that the adding the uh, scenes where it's across the galaxy is important because it's not just the Ewoks. Mm -hmm. It's across the galaxy. This whole galaxy has been ruled by the Empire for. 20 years. 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. So, I think it's a celebration for everybody, which I know I am not alone in thinking. Now, the problem is, is that, for me, <coughs> we might actually do a second podcast on Star Wars, because there's a lot of information I still want to get out there. Yeah. But, for me, some of the stuff that was put back into the uh, a New Hope and the other films, I, I would have liked to have seen the, um, the cut scene with Big Dark Lighter and Luke's uh, friends back on Tatooine. Oh yeah, because they seem like they had their own story going on, a lot of in new interest information. But all we have is a, a couple very very corroded uh, film shots. Mm -hmm. And um, we we know who Big Dark Lighter is. He was supposed to be a main a, a more major character, but he was cut yeah. in the film, and he was never really put back in. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's the character that uh, Luke always looks up to. Yeah. In the uh, novelization, which I've read, I've read all three of the novelizations, and I've also read the uh, Phantom Menace novelization. Mm -hmm. By Terry Brooks, you mentioned that earlier. Yes. Uh, the original novelization, by George Lucas, mm -hmm. uh, has Biggs Darklighter, again, as a much more major character. And when his X-Wing is blown up at the end, you mm -hmm. feel something. You're just... Because he describes it in such detail as... Literally, pieces are coming apart. Mm -hmm. I mean, Big Dark Lighter's death in the book is not pleasant. It's not pleasant. No. It's intense. Yeah, and then Han Solo basically takes on that that more mentor, best buddy role. Yeah. So his uh, Dark Lighter's death opens up another section of the story. Mm -hmm. um, like I said before, I think it was on another podcast. Lucas really didn't know how to do these films yeah. when he first started out. He was he was firing blind. He was doing stuff no one had ever done before. And, and he was taking a lot of risks, which is why... He was taking extremely a lot of risks. ...are so well remembered. Yeah, I mean, he was bringing together all these different uh, images and classic ideas. Um, he was working with Joseph Campbell, 
mm-hmm. who uh, wrote the the Man of a Thousand Faces and a lot of other. I think we talked. We did talk about. Think about. I'm trying to remember which podcast we talked about this on. Um, but we discussed a lot about uh, how Lucas was able to go back and uh, readjust his script over and over till he hammered it into the classic mythic uh, hero's journey that became Star Wars and that became Luke Skywalker's uh, uh, hero's journey. And I will give I will give George Lucas this mm-hmm. when he re- when he wrote the prequels he took the hero's journey and subverted it for Darth Vader and then turned it around and had the redemption of Darth Vader as the, as the secondary story of the uh, the original films. Yes, and I thought he did that. he did that basic story very well. Mm-hmm. But that's the problem I've had with George Lucas long, for a long time is he does basic stories extremely well. It's when he gets down to the writing, he's just not that good. Um, you look at Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. And he the- he was the uh, those were written by Lawrence Kasdan, mm-hmm. and but when you get to the prequels, he was the only one the only one writers, and it just he doesn't have the storytelling chops. He doesn't have the writing chops. He needed someone to help him out, and by that point, Joseph Campbell had already passed away. And uh, Lawrence Kasdan, I don't know if he was ever – I think he was approached, but he decided at that point in his life he just wasn't um, interested in making another Star Wars movie. Well, yeah, and at, after Return of the Jedi, he was really alienated too because Lawrence Kasdan actually put down a lot of interesting ideas that Lucas just said, mm, no. <laughs> uh, one of which was actually at the end of Return of the Jedi, apparently one of the ideas was to have Luke – walk off af- af- after everything was done, much like the original Samurais that, uh, much like the original Samurai movies that inspired the movie. Mm-hmm. Then he but, would just, his job is over, he was stepping off to go help the other, next person. He wasn't going to hang around. Yeah. And also, originally, Han Solo was supposed to die in Return of the Jedi. That's why they had that scene with uh, Han saying, looking at the Millennium Falcons, like, yeah, I just get the feeling I'm never going to see her again. Yeah. And it was supposed to be because Han Solo, or uh, sorry, Harrison Ford actually wanted to die. He felt it would make the, the story tighter, would, would bring the strength of the character. But uh, George Lucas, by that point, was like, no, that's going to mess with the merchandising. Uh, no, we're going to leave you alive. <laughs> sorry, that's my really bad George Lucas. Eh. Though I do have to bring up something I read years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, South Park did a, a whole thing about uh, George Lucas going back and doing the... Uh, uh, the remakes, not the remakes, the, re, the reissues, mm-hmm. and they were supposedly going to be doing it for um, in, in this, the South Park University. Did it with the Indiana Jones movies and absolutely ruined them. <laughs> and so the, the, the South Park boys were trying to help George Lu- tried to help George Lucas see the error of his ways, and he's like, "It's too late for me, boys. It's too late." <laughs> and ended up with like a death battle between Steven, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. Oh, well, apparently, it touched such a nerve in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Uh, that after that episode filmed, plans were abandoned by Steven Spielberg and George Lucas to go back and re and and do special editions of Indiana Jones films. <laughs> oh, nice! They were going to go in, uh, update the special effects, everything else, and they went, "Oh, okay, we're not going to do that." Or at least Steven Spielberg did that, and so <coughs> instead they went back, color corrected the films, made it, you know cleaned it up, made it look much better mm-hmm. than the original thirty five millimeter, though. Ian Steven Spielberg did go back and change for the 20th anniversary of E.T., changed the guns to uh, cell phones. Walkie-talkies. Walkie-talkies. However, he did go back, he did change, say later he actually regretted doing that. Yes. He is a big believer in just letting the original film stand in its own right. And I think that's just fine of him. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's one other thing in the uh, special editions that most people don't talk about, and it's the fact that in the special editions, the transitions are really neat. Okay, the wipes you mean, wipes and such, you mean? Yeah, uh, there's a scene in the 97 version of Return of the Jedi of, just as they're going to the sail barge assault uh, scene, Mm -hmm. it pans across a herd of Bantha, and Mm -hmm. it is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I Uh, I have to go back and rewatch these things. I've got them on DVD, but I'm not sure even which... (laughs) The problem is I'm not even sure what version of the expanded editions I have anymore. Yeah, uh, another ver- another scene that was uh, added, uh, just another transition, mm-hmm. was a takeoff of the Millennium Falcon from Docking Bay 94, just rising up, just as it's being shot at. Mm. And again, it looks really pretty. 
And when I was watching the originals the other day, I was watching it, and I'm like, wait a minute, there's supposed to be a thing there. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is the originals. Yeah, the originals, before they had all those special effects and CGI they threw in there. Yeah. Now, another thing I do want to talk about George Lucas is, I, I, I've heard this rumor, I'm not sure if it's true or not. Mm-hmm. Um, he is very loyal to his friends, and one of his best friends is Steven Spielberg. Yes. And during, um, in 1993, George Lucas was shooting Jurassic Park and then immediately went to Schindler's List. Yes. You want to talk about a juxtaposition right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but apparently, um, Spielberg called Lucas and says, I need your help. I can't edit Jurassic Park and do Schindler's List during the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, not only is it just too much work, it's also too jarring. He had to uh, devote everything he had to Schindler's List, which he considered a very important film for his his, his history. Oh, and he's yeah. right. So apparently uh, George Lucas ghost edited it, mm-hmm. which I think is really really cool of him. And he didn't take any uh, didn't take any, um, any credit for, for it, it. Yeah. which was very nice. There's another thing about the special editions that is very important for people to know. Okay. After the filming of Return of the Jedi, Lucas and his wife at the time had a huge divorce. Mm. And what happened was, she ended up with the films, the rights to the films. And so, when in the 90s, uh, the early 90s, when there wasn't as much merchandising going on and everybody was kind of sick and tired of Star Wars, Mm -hmm. there just wasn't any money coming back to Lucas anymore. Mm. So, in order to rejuvenate everything, and to set up for the prequels, he re-released them so that he could get more money again. Right, through the merchandising. Exactly. Which honestly make more money than the movies do anyway. Yes. So, that's the other reason why the special editions exist. Okay. It is for a monetary reason. And don't get me wrong, I when they were, when they were released in 97, I enjoyed them. I mean, I was 23 years old. I felt like a kid again. Certain things, you know, they made me cringe. Um, Jabba the Hutt, obviously. Yeah, Jabba the Hutt. The Jabba the Hutt scene. He looked like he looked like a bad CGI um, uh, from uh, a video game. He looked like a cutscene. Yeah. Um, I did not like Jedi Rocks um, for obvious reasons. I think that the Yuzum was completely useless, and I, you know, I understand that they had to cut. um, Was it Laptic? Lapti Neck. Lefty neck because they didn't have the rights anymore. Um, I did think it was kind of cool that the woman who played Ula came back yes. 17 years later, and or was, was it 13 years later or 15. whatever? 15. And danced the part again. Yeah. Because she's still in that damn good shape. Yeah, she was in even better shape than in the original. I can't. I, I'm 40 years. I'm, I, if I, if, if, that'd be the equivalent of me, like, you know, looking better than I did when I was 19. <laughs> which, frankly, wouldn't take much. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm not sure I want to know. Oh, no. Um, let's just say I, I, every once in a while I pull out my yearbook pictures and I go, oh, what was I thinking? I'm sorry. It was the late 80s and, and, and mullets were never a good idea. Fair enough. Uh, one of these days I'll take you out to the Wood County Historical Museum and we, we, you can go through my yearbooks there and you can just point and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, right. no um, – and but there were things I liked. I liked some of the, the new special effects, the new inserts of the X-wing. I thought that um, some things were much more valid, like in the original A New Hope when Han Solo was chasing after the stormtroopers, and then suddenly in the first in the original cut, it's only like three stormtroopers turn around and start shooting at him. He runs away. That always kind of looked kind of goofy to me. Yeah. But in the special editions, he chases around and suddenly comes into a room full of stormtroopers, and that, same- that improved the joke. That improved the joke to me. Yeah, it, it does improve the joke, but at the same time, if you were running after three fascist soldiers and then suddenly they turn around, a, they turn around a corner, turn around, and you come at, and you're still you're still coming at them, and then they start firing at you, you're gonna run away too. Oh yeah, oh yeah, but it just it, it made a lot more sense with the the room full. It's like oh okay, um, yeah. three three I could possibly handle, uh, twenty not so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no. The, but the prequels, I mean, I watched them. I own them on on uh, DVD. I don't honestly know which versions I own. Of the uh, originals, or or did you or did you actually mean the prequels, like you said? I mean, I mean the originals, the, okay. the Darth Vader one. Um, I don't. I think I own the 2002 uh, versions, which was the final re-release. Yeah, the 2004. 
Uh, yeah, Who the knows? one with uh, Hayden Christensen as as Anakin. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, I'm gonna bring it up. You know, I, I know, it, I know. It's take the bad with the good. I know uh, it's a grain of salt situation. But Lucas has never released uh, the original releases on Blu-ray or DVD, as far as I know. Not true. Not true. Okay, please explain. The uh, the originals were. Oh re- wait a minute! Didn't he like release them se- singly or something? Yeah, they re- they released them as singles. Uh, I'm actually pulling up when he that must have gotten happened. the rights back from his wife, from his ex-wife or something. Yeah, and now that uh, Disney has the rights, they oh, yeah. can re-release them with better quality and everything. Right, right. Uh, anyway, trying to find where that was. Yeah, because I remember some of people being pissed off that they had to buy them again. Yeah, it was a we have to buy these again, and it was also a situation where I. Uh, they didn't actually convert it to DVD right. Mm. I is mean, it a bad, a bad transfer? It was a very bad transfer. Okay. Which is why I I personally have copies of the VHS versions, mm. and I I actually transferred them to DVD for my own nefarious purposes. Mwahaha. Mwahaha. Because they just look better. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that would have been... 2005-ish. Okay. Now, one of the things we were talking about earlier at work, and you just looked... Ex- you, you were suddenly gleeful when I mentioned this. Yes. Um, Disney now owns the rights to all the Star Wars stuff. All of it. All of it. My question is, do they own the rights to the Star Wars Holiday Special? And if they do... We could see an official release. Because Disney, as we've said before, loves money. Yes. This will probably be a one-shot release... Maybe even a special limited edition, mm-hmm. but it could happen. They could get the original uh, tapes, and you know, even Lucas, uh, even though Lucas probably says, like, "Well, these are in Lucas Arts uh, va- vaults." No, di- no, uh, George, we own them. We want them. Yes. And have them sent out and, and, and cleaned up, and just I would basically love to see a cleaned up version of of it because then we can actually I... see how much eyeliner Mark Hamill is wearing. Yes, how much eyeliner and blush. And how 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 truly stoned Carrie Fisher is. We can also finally see just some pretty heartwarming stuff, even mm. if it is god awful. <laughs> and we can truly see Harvey Corman in his in his his natural habitat. <sighs> I don't know. I think it's I think it's funny that B. Arthur gets universal praise. <laughs> No, like a nostalgia critic and riff tracks. Everyone's like, I really just want to see more of B. Arthur's character. Oh, she yeah. sounds interesting. <laughs> well, it's true that it's her whole livelihood being shut down for who knows how long. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a heart. That's a heart wrenching tale. Yeah, and yeah, it very, is. Very, very, and it really shows the human experience too, which is something that these movies are praised for, yet. Mm. The holiday special. There is nothing. There is very little that is human about them. No, no. I just want to. I want to see the Wookie porn in high D in HD. Oh God. I'm your fantasy. I'm surprised that that's fantasy for everybody. I'm. It was the '70s, man. It was disco. I just. I barely remember when it first aired. I mean, I was very young. You know when I when I. (laughs) Uh, I actually got to see the holiday special when I was very young, back when my parents were still in the... Uh, in Utah? Yeah, back when back when we were still living in Utah, and my parents were heavily involved with the uh, Utah Fan Force, which mm-hmm. was an amateur, uh, an amateur costuming group, and uh, they did mostly Rebel stuff. Yeah. And then eventually they got involved with the 501st, which is awesome. Yes, 501st does some really, really good stuff. Yes, I've actually worn some of their uh, Stormtrooper armor for a library function, which was a lot of fun. Well, as we mentioned before, you have the body to wear like the various kind of armors and, and costumes. Mm-hmm. I would look like an overstuffed sausage, snow, uh, sausage uh, Stormtrooper. <laughs> I am not a small man. No, no you are not. I'm not like an I'm not like a planetoid, but I you know. No, you're you're no you're nowhere near Orson Welles at the end of his life. 
No, I'm I'm more like Orson Welles, mid fifties. Yeah. <laughs> Mid fifties, mid sixties, got himself a paunch, you know. He's starting to show it, but you know, still has a possibility of coming back. Right. You yeah. know what? I think we should do take your suggestion about splitting this episode up halfway through and do the prequels next week. Yeah, I think that's not a bad idea at all. That'll also give me some time to go. Maybe I'll have a chance to actually go see Revenge of the Sith by next week. I'll hold you to it, and I I'll try. I'm not going to promise it because I don't actually own it. But um, I'll see what I can as, do. As, as you are, you're, you're so kind to say, I have my sources. I do have my sources, and I can uh, spot you a copy. Okay, cool. Anyway, for this week's Thou Shalt Not, because we talked extensively about these special editions and George Lucas going back and changing things. Mm hmm. This week's Thou Shalt Not is Thou Shalt Not Let George Lucas Go Back and Change This. Now, this can be anywhere from Howard the Duck to Indiana Jones to American Graffiti to Star Wars, whatever. As long as George Lucas had his hands in it, mm -hmm. please don't change it. Yeah. Thou Shalt Not Involve Indiana Jones and Metachlorines. <laughs> Oh Christ! <laughs> Sorry, I could this first thing about my head. The uh, one thing I did mention was I just I never want to see George Lucas go back and and put a popular singer doing a, a a pop song at the end of Return of the Jedi or Empire Strikes Back or any of the prequels, honestly, because I really just don't want to hear Ariana Grande sing anything involving Jedi. You know, funny thing about the special editions though, Empire Strikes Back actually has the least fuckery in it. Oh yeah, it was already a perfect movie. Yeah, exactly. Uh, speaking of which, though, thou shalt not let George Lucas go back and make CGI versions of Ewoks and droids. They're... I don't know. I I liked droids. I remember remember Ewoks was was it was too uh, cutesy even for me back when I was like ten or eleven years old. It's what but I thought droids is... was interesting. Dro uh, it... Droids had some interesting stuff going on. It, it covered the time period between when C three PO before he before they met uh, Princess Leia, mm -hmm. and they had some cool adventures. Plus, yeah. the toys were really cool. They were rare, but they were really cool. Yes. Uh, they actually had some re-releases in Brazil, too, which was interesting. Mm. No, I remember they had, like, a... Um, plus, the, the animation was done by Nelvana, who was one, always one of my favorite uh, studios. Funny enough, they also did the animation for the uh, uh, holiday special as well. Yeah, they did that. They did Rock and Rule. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, that movie nearly bankrupted the studio. But we're, we, we can talk about that film another time. Um, okay, you, I've done Think Thou Shalt Not. It's your turn now. Okay. Uh, thou Shalt Not have George Lucas uh, remake the Hollywood Land Murders. <laughs> or Radio Land Murders. I am not Radio sure. Murders, yes, yes. Yeah. Thou Shalt Not um, let George Lucas cut together, uh, have crossovers between his properties. <sighs> I'm sorry. Do not want to see Indiana Jones and Howard the Duck. In the or yeah, just let's not have them in the cantina scene or anywhere near the things. Yes, yes. I mean, they they had Howard the Duck as a as a an Easter egg in Guardians of the Galaxy, and he was terrifying enough already. Yeah. Um, thou shalt not have uh, George Lucas. Um, thou shalt not let George Lucas do th. THX-1138, the special edition. <laughs> the THX-1138, the musical edition. Oh, Christ! <laughs> we are oppressed! We are oppressed! <coughs> this is the happy version! Yay! Uh, <laughs> Thou shalt not let George Lucas cast a boy band in the in uh, Clone Wars. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Yes. Now, contrary to popular belief, NSYNC was ca did actually appear in the film... But they were cut. Yes. Their, their parts were filmed, but even George Lucas went, oh, oh, that would be a bad idea. Yeah, sorry. Just did it for my daughter, really. I just did it for my daughter. So. Uh, but really, I, sometimes I think that he misses out on chances of – I'm sorry. If I got to see Justin Limber, Timberlake and Lance Bass get beheaded, I would laugh. Uh, thou shalt not let George Lucas go back and – I. Oh, I just had one. Damn it. I... Thou shalt not let George Lucas go back, do Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, recasting it with Justin Bieber. Gross. Yes. How dare you? I'm a horrible human being. Yes. 
Although, there is one thing that I wouldn't mind seeing. Oh? I would like to see a super special edition of the original trilogy. With all of the deleted scenes put back in. Basically, an extended edition. Okay. And, yes, I know that the Jabba the Hutt scene would be included in that. Mm -hmm. But... We can also have it with the original uh, Mulholland version. Yes, the the, the, the the big fat furry dude. Yes. Honestly, that would be an interesting way of doing it. Yeah. Also, it would open up the idea that there's multiple Jabba the Huts. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm going to play us out with Princess Leia's Life Day song from the Star Wars Holiday Yay! Special. You took my suggestion. Yep. And... I I truly kind of feel bad, because I think this is about the time Carrie Fisher started falling into cocaine. And you can really see it in this, you know? A little bit, yeah. Although, we're coming up to... uh, the point where everybody just cringes, because... She's now singing to the theme. Star Wars. I'm sorry, whenever they talk about that, I just I keep thinking of Bill Murray in the original Saturday Night Live singing Star Wars, those crazy Star Wars. Yeah. If they should bar wars, etc. Yep, yep, it was funny. Anyway. Uh, Alright, man. Well, I will talk to you soon then. Yeah, and uh, next week. We will finish up this episode with the good, the bad, and the Phantom Menace. Yes, yes. I will discuss the things I actually did like about Phantom Menace, and also the things I really hated about the Phantom Menace. And I will tell you about how about the things about Phantom Menace that make me want to drill a hole in my head. Mm-hmm. Because they exist. Anyway, from all of us here at Radioactive Walrus Entertainment... The recording closet and dance house. Hello. I'm Jonathan Knoll. And I'm Daniel Gill. Have a week, Internet. Have a week, stay safe, don't get snowed in. Uh huh. Late Night Taco Delivery is performed by Daniel Gill and Jonathan Knoll. New creepy opening by Jonathan Knoll. If you have a suggestion for a future show, would like to participate in Thou Shalt Not, or just get in contact, drop us a line on Twitter at Radio Walrus Pod. Feel free to also comment on the site you found us on. You have listened to a production of Radioactive Walrus Entertainment.